That was titled, The Elites Dance as the World Burns, and what else did you expect to happen? Welcome back, beautiful and amazing human beings. This is Lukadowski of WeAreChange.org. A lot of absolutely mind-boggling news to get into, especially with a new low for big tech monopoly censorship that is absolutely almost unbelievable happening to those who have sacrificed the most in this country. Also, in this video, we will have an interview with Amir Adani. He's the president and CEO of UEC, and we're going to be talking about some raw minerals, natural resources, and of course, the true state of the economy. Plus, of course, a lot more. Later on today, we're also going to be releasing another Luke Uncensored video. Don't forget to check for that in the emails as we're going to be talking about the very devastating and absolutely perplexing news coming out of Israel. Again, lots to talk about there, but we can only talk about that specific topic on LukeUncensored.com. But just jumping into it right now in the making of this video, U.S. President Joe Biden is addressing the nation on what is officially the end of the U.S.-Afghanistan conflict that ended just a few hours ago. He is set to defend his actions, which have been characterized as being carried out disastrously, as, of course, this withdrawal has been met with blunder after blunder, with what some people have characterized as cruel intentions. And in reality, it's as if almost every aspect of this was carried out deliberately in a sabotaging way, as there's too many mistakes to even mention here as even the final exit which was done 24 hours in advance also had a lot of criticism met with it as of course fully kitted out Taliban fighters are seen on video taking over the airport as we're also finding out that Taliban members made a deal with the United States to offer them security in a secret arrangement to see them off. What did the Taliban get in exchange? Well, again, we, we don't know, but uh, they got a lot, including billions of dollars of advanced weaponry and Black Hawk helicopters, which they were flying yesterday, even flying one of their members off of it in uh, what looked like a... Uh, Sort of a, a weird joyride. As some people were speculating that this man was deceased, he was not. He's seen moving in these videos. Whether this is some form of punishment or someone volunteering to do something, again, we, we don't know the understanding of it yet. But the bigger controversy is around service dogs. As the American Humane Society came out and said that the United States has left trained canine members of the U.S. military behind on the tarmac. As there are reports that the dogs were literally set loose and left behind at the barbed-wired airport, which there's videos showing dogs just walking around. The American Humane Society has said that the United States has, quote, handed a death sentence to these working dogs that were left behind. And of course, their faith is still unknown. And it wasn't just service dogs that were left behind. It was also hundreds of American citizens, Canadian citizens that were trying to leave and couldn't. Now, whether it's leaving American citizens behind, abandoning service dogs, leaving behind military hardware, Black Hawk helicopters, and billions of dollars of advanced weaponry, while of course turning tail and running along with the Afghan security forces and politicians that they put into place, this is an utter mess. Who's going to be held accountable for this mess? Well, for right now, a Marine who released the video criticizing this administration for doing so, who is relieved of duties and resigned as a Marine Corps officer for speaking out against this huge, some would say blunder, some would say purposeful disaster, while the people in command look like they aren't even bothered with what's going on right now. And as we know, the situation is only going to get worse, especially with trapped Americans, even especially with not just the advanced military hardware that was given by the U.S. taxpayer to the Taliban, but also the latest news that this administration plans on giving Afghanistan billions of dollars in foreign aid. And it's important to note here, in most circumstances, foreign aid usually goes into the hands of the corrupted leadership of the country receiving it, and that's most likely what's going to be happening here. And just when you thought this entire disgusting matter couldn't get any nastier, we're learning today that the mother 
of a Marine killed recently at the Kabul airport had her Instagram account disabled because she criticized the president of the United States for his policies that led to the death of her son. It's also important to note here that President Biden met with this mother with, of course, no cameras or media present. And when this mother confronted Joe Biden, she says that he turned his back on her while rolling his eyes when he was confronted. But again, the bigger aspect, the more troubling aspect here is that this mother had her Instagram account taken down. Her account was disabled after she criticized the president on Facebook just when he thought big tech censorship couldn't hit a new low couldn't be more disgusting, couldn't be more clear and transparent with what they're actively doing. I mean, imagine, imagine being a, a mother, losing your son, and then losing your voice to even be able to raise concerns about what happened to your loved one. Holy freaking cow, this is a new level of audacity that is as dumbfounding as it is disgusting. Now, it is important to note here that Instagram actually restored her account after this story went viral. They said that this was, quote, all a mistake, but they won't answer about why this happened in the first place or why this mother's account was, was flagged. Why was her, her voice taken out why was she censored we still don't know what did she say that violated the rules and laws that are unknown to anyone from these big tech social media companies we don't know now there's a lot of controversy with, with biden checking his watch at the funeral processions and sure say whatever you want about that but taking a mother's voice away trying to hide her feelings her emotions her speech when she's desperately trying to speak to the world is absolutely, I can't, I can't even, I, I, again, this is a family-friendly show, so I can't even d describe the words that I'm trying to use right now. But whether it's the Taliban getting billions of dollars, whether it's the brain drain that is going to be affecting that country even more, whether if it's this country bombing that country for decades now and then importing their citizenry into this country without even any questions, it's fair to say that what's going to happen in the future is going to be very troubling, not just for Afghanistan, but also for the United States. Biden is already becoming very agitated and aggressive when it comes to this particular issue. I'm not, I'm not supposed to take any questions, but go ahead. Mr. President, on Afghanistan? I'm not going to answer Afghanistan now. Can you say if there's still an acute risk? As of course, it's also important to note now that the Taliban are not just sitting on billions of American dollars, they're also sitting on trillions of dollars of raw earth, minerals, and natural resources that are estimated to be worth one trillion dollars, which of course they will be working and cooperating with China and Russia most likely in order to attain those minerals. And that's why in the second part of this video, I wanted to bring an expert in minerals, someone in the business of them, how they work to get a better understanding what is happening with our energy policy our current economic policy while of course getting to talk about their company and that's why it's important to tell you that this part of the video was conducted on behalf of UEC we are working with them for this interview and for me this is a win-win for everyone we get to hear about the real world situation in our economic sector while Amir gets to talk about his company and with people labeling this administration's energy policy as an utter disaster I think it will be worth finding out what's actually going on. Now, I think it's safe to say when major corporate media from the left and the right agree with each other, that usually signals big trouble for everyone else. As, of course, we have this latest article by CNN Business that is entitled, A Key Inflation Measure Rose at Fastest Pace in 30 Years in July. And then, of course, we have a Fox Business one saying almost the same exact thing. Fed's inflation measure soars by most in 30 years. Now, with obvious clear inflation, the price of commodities, the price of everyday household items, the price of even uranium going up, what's really going on here? Well, to talk about that plus a lot more, we have Amir Adani who will help us answer those questions plus a lot more. Now, Amir, you're in the uranium business. What's going on there? Not only with uranium, but with energy policies, the economy. From, from your perspective, what's going on here that we are not being told about? Let me just say, you know, just off the bat here. I mean, I know when people hear about nuclear power, they hear about nuclear technology right away, 
your mind uh, turns uh, towards uh, Hiroshima or uh, Chernobyl or Fukushima, these, uh, these episodes that uh, have come to really haunt what is otherwise an incredible technology that can generate abundance of energy, clean energy without any emissions. Uh, and and what, what, what I really kind of want to get you to think about here is what we're not being told is this premise of around how renewable energy, solar and wind, somehow magically on their own, when they only work about 25 to 30% of the time, only when the wind blows and when the sun shines, are gonna solve all of our energy needs. This to me is not only a hypocrisy, but it's really this grave secret. Why? Because politicians wanna swing whichever way they think the votes are gonna be. They think it's unpopular to support nuclear power. Yet, the thing is popular to go after the hydrocarbon industry. Left in the middle of all of this, they want to basically bet the farm, bet the house, bet the country that wind and renewable are going to be the answer to our energy needs, to the needs of a world that more than ever relies on electricity, electricity to drive electric vehicles, electricity to uh, recharge your phones and get on your laptops and anything and everything we do now, especially in today's virtual world, all relies on electricity. A modern healthcare system, modern education system needs reliable electricity. I underline the word reliable. How could it be reliable if it only works 25 to 30% of the time? That's what's called the capacity factor for solar and renewable. Again, due to the fact that they don't work all the time, the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So this is the inconvenient truth. And the reality is that this is what we're not being told, that, that there isn't some, uh, you know, just uh, easy walk through the park to get to this kind of perfect way of living and this kind of perfect way of gen generating electricity. But I'm here, I guess, to tell you that I think it, nuclear power is dr pretty darn perfect, actually, considering what all of its attributes are, despite this fear perception, this, 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 this unknown elements that we have around it, because of uh, because of what I said at the outset of this interview. Yeah, well, uh, energy policy is key towards economic policies, and, and the two go together, and they're very correlated, as we're going to be talking about in a little bit. But as you were mentioning, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of disinformation. There's also a lot of PR propaganda by big industries trying to push policies that benefit them and not everyone else. There's a lot to get into, but before we jump into all that, Amir, for people who don't know you, who are you? And specifically, what is UEC? Look, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I believe in, in free enterprise. I think the most incredible thing to happen to the progress in our society have been individuals who uh, take on risk, accept risk as a way of achieving um, economic freedom. And they go out there and they build businesses, they create jobs, they create progress, they, they innovate, and they push forward. Uh, and so as an entrepreneur, I became very fascinated with the uranium mining industry, especially in the United States, uh, 16 years ago. For the last 16 years, I've been the CEO, initially the founder, and since founding the company, the CEO of a company called Uranium Energy Corp. Now, what got me interested to, to build this company as an entrepreneur is really the environment in the US where I looked at domestic uranium mining, I looked at the fact that it was an industry that was really dying. And I asked myself a fundamental question, should this industry be dying? And the answer was very clear. It was really looking at nuclear power plants, uh, almost a hundred of which at the time were operating in the US 16 years ago. Some have retired since then, but there's still close to 94 reactors operating in the US and they're generating enough electricity whereby one in every five home in America is powered by those nuclear reactors. Th these nuclear reactors are generating more electricity uh, than, than any other source that's emission free in a, in a world that's trying to decarbonize. Whether you believe in decarbonizing or not, the reality is there's major goals being set by our government uh, and governments around the world about achieving net zero and, and not, uh, not generating carbon emissions by 10, 15 years from now. So as an entrepreneur, I looked at this and thought to myself, how could we be so dependent? This is 16 years ago. This is before all these buzz terms were invented. 
Back then, the buzz term was nuclear renaissance. And I thought, how can we be so dependent on nuclear power? And to run these nuclear power plants, you need uranium. Yet, the uranium that is needed in the United States is being imported heavily from Russia, from Kazakhstan, from Uzbekistan. And this didn't seem logical to me. This seemed like it was a supply chain problem. And that ultimately, I thought this was a great opportunity to build a business, dig into it, figure out what's going on, and and really, um, or, uh, along the way, uh, what has come out of uranium energy is we were we are one of the only companies in the last 15 years to build a new uranium mine in the U.S. We mine uranium in South Texas. We continue today to have uh, developed and built over the last 16 years a platform that makes us the premier uranium mining company in the U.S. But to be the premier uranium mining company in the U.S. means that you really have the people, the infrastructure, and the projects on standby, ready for a high enough uranium price to get back into production. You mentioned at the very beginning of this interview that even the uranium prices are up year to date. They are, but they're still well below the incentive levels to build new uranium mines in the U.S. and across the world. Many of the state-owned companies of China and Russia have been really suppressing and trying to control the uranium market. And it's really free enterprise in the U.S. that is coming back and really wanting to change that landscape. I'm also a big believer as an entrepreneur in the gold sector. I'm the founder of a company called Gold Mining. I, I, I think the way government has been just printing trillions of dollars, creating more debt in the last two years, than was created at the end of World War II is unsustainable. Uh, the, the way we're running uh, monetary policy is uh, really is about debasement of currency. So I'm a big believer in gold as an asset class, as a currency. But what I have an vantage point of, Luke, is really seeing how all of these decisions collectively by governments across the world is ultimately reflected in commodity prices. You can't lie about the commodity price. Commodity price captures inflation. Commodity prices capture all realities that maybe you don't, you know, people, the government may not want you to know, but they can't keep it out of the commodity price. That, that's why gold's at $1,800 an ounce. That's why silver uh, is trading over $20 an ounce. That's why I believe those commodity prices are going much higher. But uranium is fascinating. Uranium is at $34 per pound. Its all-time high is $140 per pound. It's one of the cheapest asset classes that I know of. It's one of the cheapest commodities in the world that I know of where the price is today relative to where its all-time high is. And despite appreciating year-to-date, which confirms an upward trend, I think uranium prices are actually poised for a much bigger move here. And what I really like about uranium, to some extent, maybe more so than gold, is the fact that it's a depleting commodity. You got to consume it. Year in and year out, these nuclear power plants need to consume uranium to generate electricity, and then they need more. Just in the U.S. alone, consumption rate is 50 million pounds per year, yet we mine zero uranium. No uranium mining here in the U.S., and it's being primarily imported from Russia and Kazakhstan. I think that's obscene. And I think that should be an energy and national security concern to anyone sensible listening or thinking about. Ultimately, I think it's also an opportunity. So I'm not tackling it as, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman. I wanna build a business for my shareholders that ultimately could solve an issue that's an energy security issue, but really create wealth along the way for the shareholders that are part of this, you know, part of this journey and part of the platform that we're building at Uranium Energy Corp. Now, there, there's a lot of different energy industries out there. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think a lot of them are, ex are as successful as their PR is or how much lobbyist they have at the U.S. government. Because when you look at American policy, especially energy policy, which I want to talk about in, in just a little bit. But but when, when you look at what the United States is doing, a lot of it is absolutely nonsensical. And on a global impact level, there's a lot of misunderstanding understanding especially with people talking about clean renewable energies and not understanding the longer bigger consequences of it and not understanding energy at all so you know what is you know nuclear energy actually used for what are some of the misunderstandings around it what's what what countries you're using it and what what's it what's its larger purpose one of the most uh, uh, energy dense commodities in the world 
that is very abundant in the Earth's crust is uranium. Natural uranium is um, uh, the main uh, the, the main commodity that starts the nuclear fuel process, whereby uranium ultimately becomes the fuel inside a nuclear reactor that ultimately generates um, uh, enough heat that uh, that generates electricity through uh, the uh, the development of turbines within a nuclear power reactor that leads to roughly 20% of US electricity generation that's emission free uh, over and, and in terms of all emission free electricity generation over 50% of all emission free electricity generation in the US is coming from nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power globally is in seeing incredible uh, uh, developments and uh, you're seeing countries from United Arab Emirates, that's a very oil and gas rich country, uh, building uh, reactors, Saudi Arabia is talking about building 16 reactors. These guys have a lot of oil, they have a lot of gas, but they're pivoting towards major investments in nuclear power. And so there's uh, close to 56 uh, reactors on the construction worldwide. And it really goes hand in hand with uh, the rise in global population as, as the world basically is projected to reach over 9 billion people worldwide population over the next 15 years. That basically means we need more energy, we need more resources, we need more infrastructure. And you just can't put all your eggs in one basket. You can't just keep burning uh, coal or gas to generate electricity. You can't rely on just, on just so solar and wind. You need different forms of energy generation that can basically be the answer to everyone's modern needs of living, which is a very electricity intensive ways of life. Just look at the transformation in, uh, in, in the automotive industry around electric vehicles. More and more car makers are announcing plans to go all electric over the next five years some even sooner. And so all of that just means that you and I will need to be recharging some aspect, some tool, some toy of our life, whether it's your car or other devices throughout a 24 seven cycle. So we really need a realistic discussion around what kind of energy matrix, what kind of energy plan and mix can actually be the realistic solution for all of that. So. I think at the end of the day, there's a huge growth story here. The rest of the world from developing nations to U.S. rivals like China and Russia are major, making major investments in nuclear technology. China is really leading the way. This is an area where the U.S. led the way in the in 1970s, 1980s, was, was definitely the first country in the world to develop a substantial fleet of nuclear reactors. But we just haven't paid a lot of attention to, to this industry over the last 20 years, both uranium mining and nuclear technology. Some changes are underway. Department of Energy has come out with uh, a number of studies that concludes the U.S. has to become self-sufficient when it comes to uranium mining. We currently have no uranium mining that we should invest in innovations around new reactor technologies and continue safety protocols uh, and, and to really be an exporter of nuclear technology. Currently, U.S. reactors and U.S. technology is not being exported around the world. It used to be the, the, the seminal part of any reactor construction in the world it used to be U.S. technology. Today, it's all Chinese technology and Russian technology. And there's a concerted effort and dialogue and, and discussion and plans taking place to really try to change that. And we're talking, these are big industries. This isn't going to happen overnight. We're talking about big long-term projects and developments but it's a fascinating area to pay attention to. Uh, one where investors might find a lot of in interesting investment opportunities like the field of uranium mining that we're talking about, but also with small modular reactors. And you know, uh, why is Bill Gates putting hundreds of millions of dollars of his own capital into the research and development of small modular reactors? And he sees the big picture and the long-term uh, value proposition. Now, uh, in the U.S., is there any uranium currently being found or, or mined at all? And, and if so, is, is there kind of some kind of reaction to it or effect on the economy because of it? The only company currently drilling for uranium and developing a project is my company, Uranium Energy Corp. We are the only company currently with an active drill program in South Texas at our Burke Hollow project, which we discovered in 2012. We've permitted it for production and we're developing it as part of our South Texas hub and spoke strategy. Our hub 
is our processing plant, Hobson, where we process uranium that has been mined using the environmentally friendly institute recovery method at various spokes or individual mine sites where we have a very benign footprint where we're mining using this this institute recovery method is not your uh, kind of uh, grandfather's way of mining where it's strip mining and you see a big open pit and you see a lot of big trucks moving earth around. Institute recovery is nimble, it's low cost, it's basically drilling shallow water wells three, 400 feet deep from surface. Uh, and we dissolve uranium in solution uh, using a carbonated uh, solution or reagent, and that gets shipped to the processing plant for recovery. There's a, over a 30 year history of this kind of mining in the US and states like Texas and Wyoming. I encourage anyone who's interested to go to our website at uraniumenergy.com to take a look at how this process works. But uh, I, again, I think it's mind boggling that only one company being Uranium Energy Corp is actively drilling and developing and, uh, and and engaged in uranium mining in the U.S. today. That's got to change. And I think it will change. The Department of Energy in the U.S. wants to establish a reserve, a uranium reserve, like a strategic stockpile, similar to the strategic petroleum stockpile, where they buy uranium for the government's account. Because they're concerned as well that this is an area that, again, the Chinese and the Russians are running away with it. And they control the market. So effective uh, later this year and hopefully for the next 10 years, the U.S. government will look to mine newly, uh, look to buy newly mined uranium from U.S. sources. That's wonderful for a company like ours who spent 16 years acquiring, uh, permitting, even mining uranium from exactly that, U.S.-based projects. And there's a scarcity of players like this. There just are not many companies that founded um you know, you had to be real contrarian and long term to be in uranium for the last decade because we had a long bear market. One of the longest bear markets in any commodity was in the last decade in uranium. And we're coming out of that. We've been coming out of that in the last couple of years and it's starting to get a lot better. But you had to be there when it was a hated sector. And uranium is arguably still a hated sector. But if you have a contrarian bent, and if you look at the facts and you say, uh-uh, this doesn't make sense. This, why should this be a hated sector? We need uranium. We need uranium where the lights go out. And if you look at that simple value proposition, the last decade was a great time to be in the sector when it was hated. And as things started to, because that, that was a perfect time to buy assets. We were acquiring projects. We were building a portfolio. We were building our platform uh, and patiently waiting our, our time for when things would start to improve. And again, this is well before the government decided they want to buy uranium for the next decade. And all the issues that we're seeing now, we anticipated that. Yeah. And we built our company, positioned Uranium Energy Corp to really be in a, the lead position, the pole position to take advantage of uh, the recovery that we're starting to witness right now. Now, I would really want to talk about Biden's kind of policy and position on all of this. His energy policy has been deemed a, a total disaster since, of course, he cut off a lot of oil production here in the United States while asking OPEC to drill for more oil and produce more oil. But but from your perspective and from your ear on the ground, how's the Biden administration currently doing with their energy policy? And how would you compare it to, of course, Donald Trump's policy on energy? Well, the, you know, the Trump administration commenced... Um, uh, an investigation into the whole area with uh, uh, the dependence or the overdependence on foreign uranium was an investigation that the Department of Commerce kicked off during the Trump administration. And the conclusion of that led to the Trump White House creating what uh, was called the nuclear fuel working group from the White House, from within the White House to further look at this issue of overdependence on foreign uranium. And uh, the conclusions came out last April uh, in a study that looked at, again, restoring America's competitive advantage in the global nuclear uh, energy landscape. And again, had those conclusions that uh, I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, a, 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 a building a program to purchase newly mined uranium and stockpiling uranium for the government account. Uh, getting behind nuclear technology and innovation, and then again, exporting 
that American technology and reasserting American dominance in the, in the global field. What's, what's interesting and perhaps, uh, again, reassuring to some extent, is that with the Biden administration, we haven't seen at all, um, you know, like with most, most administrations, right? New administration comes in and just wants to basically uh, do the exact opposite on everything from healthcare to finance to taxes of what the previous administration did. Not on this matter, not on this issue of nuclear technology and uranium. They, Biden administration, in my opinion, has picked up the ball where the Trump administration left off following the recommendations of uh, of that report from last sum, uh, spring. Uh, new Energy Secretary Granholm has been very vocal talking about the importance of nuclear uh, energy uh, to her and her this administration. And they're really, uh, in my opinion, and even if you look at the latest stimulus package, you know, it included major uh, boost and support for nuclear power plants in this country. So there is this quiet um, sort of bipartisan, perhaps, uh, support developing for nuclear energy like we've never seen before. And I think it goes back to this uh, reality that I talked about at the very beginning of this interview, which is the thing we're not told or talked about is that solar and wind can't carry the day on their own. They simply can't. And there needs to be a reliance on other forms of energy and the number one source of energy when it comes to scale and size that can that can replace what we lose by utilizing less hydrocarbons is nuclear power. Nothing even comes close. But again, because of that unpopular nature of nuclear power, because sometimes people you feel like it's hated, politicians don't like talking about it. But I think that's wrong because you should got to look at this objectively. You got to look at it with facts and figures. And why not just look at it for yourself? rather than having politicians curate what is appropriate for someone to know or not to know. So I think it really, and I really hope it changes because the nuclear technology is really a key solution to not only how we fight climate issues, but how we also make ourselves more energy independent. But to do that, we got to make sure that we're not so dependent on foreign fuels to run the biggest nuclear fleet in the world, which are the 94 reactors operating on US soil right now. It's the largest nuclear fleet anywhere in the world that's generating electricity. Uh, yeah, I mean, with the Biden administration, I mean, anything could happen at any moment. A lot of this is very unpredictable, which leads me to the next question. How do you see these kind of trends moving forward from here from a kind of business perspective? Pretty much, how do you guys operate as a business model in this current unpredictable landscape? Look, uh, just looking, for example, at our share price, we're a public company, right? We're, we're, we're trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Our share price just over the last year has doubled and is showing... Um, a lot of renewed interest in it from energy investors that are focused or, uh, uh, and are concerned about the environment and environment imp uh, uh, environmental impact as well. Um, we see uh, uh, the uranium price uh, has risen uh, by just actually 10, 15 percent in the last couple of weeks because there's some fundamental changes taking place in the physical uranium market where historically it was just a Kind of a very slow quiet commodity in terms of how it traded and now the, the 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 firm that was founded by the billionaire commodity commodity investor eric sprott uh, sprott asset management has come in and acquired a, a, this physical uranium etf called the sprott uranium trust and they've really kind of shaken up the market over the last two weeks it's quite fascinating a uranium market that previously was very illiquid and flat has now become very dynamic just in the last two weeks and we're seeing price appreciation on the commodity. And so I hate to think about just what, let's say, um, the Biden administration or the Trump administration may or may not do. You'd hate to be in a business where you're constantly thinking about what politicians are gonna do. I'm looking at the fact that in reality, from a year ago to now, we're seeing a really good fundamental case get developed for our business and be reflected in our share price. And I look at the fact that we live in a world today where, you know, the stock market, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500, how many new all time highs have they had this year? Like over 50, right? Everything in this world is at an all time high. And uranium, one of the most fundamental commodities for something so integral to day to day living, 
electricity generation is trading at a third of its all-time high. This is one asset class that hasn't really caught a bid yet. And it's because it isn't your typical asset class that everyone runs to when they, you know, when the market gets going. Because again, it's sort of this, this, this almost not forgotten, but it's just, it's an industry, a sector people don't talk about. But it's real and the demand is real. And I think the economic case is really powerful. And when I think about our company, we have patiently taken 16 years to assemble a team of individuals that understand uranium mining, that have been there for decades, involved in exploring for uranium, permitting uranium mines, oper operating uranium mines safely. We've acquired uranium projects throughout uh, the southwestern U.S. states of Texas, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, and uh, and and we are really it, it, it is about having a pipeline. It takes seven to ten years to get permits to mine uranium. We have four projects that are fully permitted. And it, it, this is a long dated, long term industry in terms of how you got to think and plan. And we've made that commitment. And I think when when I look at the economic case for our company, I think that we've endured a, a brutal long bear market, longest winter you can imagine. And the uranium price and all the developments that we've talked about really points to an inflection point, a positive inflection point that simply says you can't continue like this with where, where the world consumes uh, 200 million pounds of uranium annually and only produces 130 million pounds annually. You keep doing that year in and year out, and eventually the commodity price has to go up to stimulate growth and interest in developing new uranium mines because every year we're consuming more uranium than what we produce. To me, that's a bullish setup. I don't know too many other commodities or sectors where the setup is like that, where there's, in my opinion, so much more upside uh, exposure or potential. And I see very little downside from these levels because at these levels of $34 uranium, no one's justifying the ability to build a new uranium mine. And so supply isn't picking up at these levels. Supply will pick up, I would guess, around 50 to $55 per pound. That's what most new projects that have been kind of sketched out or where there's an economic study that has been done. That's the price you hear over and over in economic studies. And that's not even adjusted for the inflation that we've seen, which is real just in the last year. You adjust all of these projections for the, the real in inflation that we see in the system today and everything. Uh, and again, um, there's, there's arguably a very interesting uranium market in front of us that could become a bull market like we've never seen. Amir, thank you so much for your very unique perspective. I never thought I'd be talking to someone in the uranium business, but but here we are. I mean, energy policy is economic policy. It's political policy. There's so many intertwined things involved here. And I think you really gave us a very kind of different perspective than what we usually get, especially on the mainstream media. So before we go, is there anything else do you want to say? How can people find out more information about you? And then also, do you have any stocks in the company yourself? I'm the largest individual shareholder in the company. Uh, you look up the top holders. Our company's biggest holders include some of the big funds like BlackRock or Fidelity. And then you see my name in there right there as a, as a top five shareholder. So very much aligned with some... Um, uh, big names that I think adds credibility to what we're doing and what, what we're talking about. You can find that a lot more at www.uraniumenergy.com. Uh, and uh, also you can follow me on Twitter if you're there and you're interested. Uh, I'm at Amir Adnani, my first and last name. And I, I write about and I tweet about uh, uranium, gold, commodities, and uh, so some various kind of uh, touch points between uh, Twitter and our corporate website. We'll definitely put the links to that, plus a lot more, in the description below so you guys could check out Amir and all he's up to just by clicking the link down below. Amir, again, thank you so much for that perspective. A very unique, very kind of different interview that I ever thought I would be doing, but I appreciate the perspective. I appreciate your kind of ear-on-the-ground information. It was great to talk to you. And if you enjoyed that as much as I did, share this video with your friends and family members because if it's not for people watching, liking, and sharing this video, I wouldn't be here, and this is why... I love you guys. Stay tuned for more here on wearechange.org.